what we just heard was the congratulatory cantata that was composed uh, in 1763 by Haydn for the celebration of Prince Nicholas Esterhazy's name's day. So basically this was composed right around the time that the cello concerto was composed and you can hear that similarity. In fact, it's exactly the same theme. Haydn repurposed this aria for his C major cello concerto and we can definitely take the title Great Hero into consideration when we play. By the way, uh, Haydn borrowed heavily from another cello concerto by uh, Miss Livacek for the second movement of this concerto, so check it out if you have time. It's really interesting. The D major concerto is also borrowed from that one movement by Miss Livacek. In this fast movement, we should try to find surprises in the details, not to worry too much about the long line, as opposed to the slow movement where the challenge is to make the audience forget about the small units by creating a long line. I like starting on the A string with no vibrato. We are sneaking in. It's not a, uh, it's more like you start from nothing. Thumb. I think the Rostropovich edition is excellent for fingerings, but I do check the Urtex edition for more original uh, slurs. So let's look at bar 58. We have E, then F, G. So this is nice to bring this line out. Here we have two voices. The higher one is the G, A, G, and the second voice is the lower one. So together. And here we have again C, D. Look at bar 71. I like practicing with the score sometimes because I can actually play the cello part, the orchestral cello part, and hear, feel the harmonies uh, better. Another thing about this movement, there's a lot of syncopations. So we have... Uh, so we have the cello line that's moving bar by bar. So starting in bar 71 and we go against that downbeat so we have an orchestral cellos but we play so if we were to put those together it'd be bar 79 we have a diminished 7 chord lighter feel. Uh, there's a lot of uh, abrupt changes of mood in this movement. Um, and notice in bar 82 the winds are playing and we answer a couple of bars after that with the... It will be great to think of our as an answer or a continuation of what the winds did just uh, two bars earlier in bar 82. Then we have a longer line in the celli, it's starting in bar 5. Um, ending in a diminished seventh chord again. So when you play your solo line, you can keep in mind that moving uh, descending line in the cellos. <laughs> Just warming up here. It's morning, so excuse my. And this is uh, one of the hardest parts, as you know, of this movement. <laughs> This is the chicken dance. That's uh, very tricky. The way to work on this is 
the way I work on any other fast piece with dotted rhythms. <laughs> Also, I like to work on uh, slurred passages with separate bows. This helps the equality in the notes. So. Bar 95, we have again a heavy second beat. good to figure out how long phrases are if some phrases are four bars long and some are are not an even number they're odd number so let's look at bar 95 we have those great syncopations that really bring this movement to life so so the second bit is always emphasized in a way so if it wasn't for those syncopations it will be Obviously much less interesting. Let's look at the phrase starting in bar 107. It's a four bar phrase. So you will notice we have those turns. And then, but the second turn falls on a different beat. So things are not as predictable as they could have been. Let me play it uh, as if uh, Haydn was not uh, a genius as he is. So this is a very predictable way of writing. Then the, uh, the turn always falls on the same beat, which is a fourth beat in this case. But Haydn changed things around. So... Obviously the turn falls on the second beat. If you're aware of it, it might be enough. You don't have to bring it out, but it might make things more interesting for you when you play it to realize those little quirkinesses. Let's look at bars 181, 183, and 185. We have appoggiaturas. So. Yeah, etc. So it is again the second beat that is uh, also important so and then perhaps the last one more so we have that heavy first beat and heavy second beat so those bars if we look at the accompaniment in the orchestra first we have an eighth rest only so they come in one when we have the syncopations in bars 188, for example, here the strings are on the downbeat. So, it is nice to work from the score so you can really see what's going on. Bar 190, and be sure this is short because the strings take it from us the strings come in the next eighth notes. We could think of those four last eighth notes in this bar as being connected. And again, bar 191. So try sometimes to play with the orchestral cello line. I also like to feel bar 90 and 90 two as different. So we have uh, and perhaps do something different with that D. It can be less, it can be more, but don't play it the same. In bar 197, in the cellos, uh, they're playing a, lo a lot of C's and we play against them. Keep in mind that the this this C long C in the cello it, it gives us some tension uh, against what we're doing. It is nice if the orchestra drops in bar 201, so drops and then crescendos on each of those bars. can a 
also crescendo on each of those uh, bars. If we look at bar 211, we have a six bar phrase. And then there are two bars. And then another two bars. And then there's an ending. It is sometimes easier to figure out how the phrase goes, how many bars are in a phrase if you look at the accompaniment, actually. So if I am to play the cello line, the cello, orchestra cello line. It is clear that it, it's two bars, two bars, and two bars, to me. <laughs> Notice the minor in bar 228. And here the orchestra has pianissimo, uh, so you can really take advantage of that. And and here another of those syncopations. Little time before we go on to 236. This is the last time. Uh, there's more off beats in 243. <laughs> to sit a little bit in uh, 211 on the second beat. Maybe just once, not again in the sequence. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.